Hi everyone and welcome to the first edition, to the very first edition of the DFMA conference. I'm very excited and very nervous, honestly, because uh, there are more than 200 people listening to this conference and uh, more and more people are joining. And uh, we have people from all over the world. Uh, there, are from, there are people from North America, from uh, South America, uh, Australia, South Africa, Scandinavia, uh, from all over Europe. So, well, Thank you, thank you very much to everyone. And um, it seems that uh, this topic, the DFMA, is very important uh, and it's very important to develop uh, our industry, our timber industry. And uh, yeah, uh, this is the first edition, so it's, I'm, as I said, I'm quite nervous, but uh, I'm sure everything will be fine, everything will work uh, perfectly. So um, this is the program for today. We have we will we are a couple of minutes late, uh, but we waited until uh, uh, waited for someone some, someone more to to join us. Uh, I will make a short introduction, uh, 10, 15 minutes, and then we will have uh, uh, we will have five great speakers from all over the world. Five, I think, one of the probably the top players in the market in the timber industry and I will introduce them uh, very shortly. Um, you see here in the Central European time uh, we will have uh, about one hour and a half uh, those, uh, the speaker will present, uh, will say something about uh, their activities, will say something about what they are doing and why uh, and they, ex they show us the, their vision about the DFMA and the timber industry and then we'll have a, a, a round table, a Q&A session, and I really look forward to doing this because it will allow you to, uh, to ask questions uh, to our guests. Uh, so please, we are online actually on three different channels, Zoom, LinkedIn, and YouTube. So feel free to write, your, to type your uh, questions. Uh, um, so we can work on them and we can ask our speakers later during the round table to reply your question. Uh, shortly, who we are, Ergodomus is an, an engineering firm founded by me in 2007. We are located in Italy, in the Alps. It is a beautiful area. Yesterday we had the Giro d'Italia, the race of uh, cyclists. 100 meters from our office, and these pictures was taken at the top of the last climb. So it was very hard, and uh, I took that that picture a few uh, a few months ago. Why are we talking about mass timber? Why are we talking about the DFMA? This diagram is very important. It shows you how the production, the global production, all over the world changed in the past 25 years, 23 years. In 1995, the global production was uh, about 25,000 cubic meter per year. Last year, the capacity was almost 2 million of cubic meter. And we expect, uh, the, uh, we expect to see a global total production of about almost 3 million of cubic meter by the end of the next year. It's great it is an exponential and this proves that the industry believes that clt must be the future and uh, clt is one of the solutions for to the building for the building industry to decarbonize the uh, yeah the building industry Just to give you a global overview, a better global overview of what is happening around the world, this is a map, the mass timber map we will launch in a while. Uh, and uh, it is a map co collecting all the factories all around the world working in the mass timber industry, somehow involved in the mass timber industry or in the production of the glulam. So you see that there are many, many industries all over the world and many others are, uh, getting on the market uh, shortly in the next uh, few weeks or in the next months or in the next couple of years. 
Ergodomus is an, is an engineering firm, uh, as I said, and we worked internationally. We've been working international for a few year, internationally for a few years. And uh, this is a map showing where we engineered uh, some of our mostly, uh, some of our projects. Uh, uh, and uh, this is the reason I met many of our speakers, many of the speakers I, uh, I will introduce uh, at the end of my presentation in a couple of minutes. And working internationally gave us the opportunity to work with many different players on the market. So we work for producers, designers, developers, and uh, builders. This gave us the opportunity, the possibility to have a global overview of the market and especially to understand how important is the DFMA. It is an acronym that I will explain later what it means and it is, in my opinion, one of the most important keywords of, for the timber industry to grow and to prove that timber is the most cost-effective cost material to go for. We engineered many, many different types of buildings in these years, uh, residential, commercial buildings, and every time was a challenge to prove that timber was the best solution. Every time was a challenge to say, yes, timber is the, very, the most cost-effective solution and at the same time is the greenest material to go for. We're not talking only about small buildings, but fortunately, the real estate, the investors are more and more getting familiar with timber. But we need to get uh, to overcome some, uh, some obstacles and to convince them to go for timber, to go for real for timber. What is our vision and why do I believe that timber is the uh, the DFMA is the mo one of the most important keywords when we talk uh, when it comes to talk about timber. Everyone is familiar with this image. It is taken from the movie Matrix, and you should probably I think you're saying, what does the movie have to do with the reality? What does it have to do with the timber industry? It does, because. Uh, now in 2022, it is time to go for digital, to use the digital uh, technologies on the market to design our buildings. It is absolutely important to create a digital model and uh, um, a digital model which, is, which can be shared easily among all the other players, all the other designers, all the other stakeholders involved in the project. So, Specifically, in our, um, in our industry, in the timber industry, we use a digital model. Digital means an endless sequence of 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, etc. And behind, below this uh, endless sequence, we have the digital model. We have all the connections. We have all the timber elements. We have all the members. We have all the properties of the materials. So the, the digital model, the, the building for us, it is something below a digital file. It is something below a PDF file or a DWG file or a file for the CNC machine. The digital model is so important that you can send it to the client they can watch everything, they can check everything on the screen, and then they can say, yes, this is what I wanna see on, the, on, on site. So once they see the drawing, they will receive exactly that element on site, no matter how big it is, no matter how complex it is. They will receive that because a CNC machine will work on that element, will machine that element accordingly to the 3D drawing. So let's come to the DFMA, Design for Manufacturing and Assembly. In my opinion, DFMA means also to start engineering a project, to start engineering a building from the very end, going back to the beginning. So when 
you use the DDFMA approach in designing a, a building, you need to think about how to lift, how to install the elements, how to install the CLT panels on site, go back, how they will be transported to the site, go back, how they will be produced in the factory, go back, how they will design. They will be designed. So you have to be in your mind the whole process from the beginning to the end, from the end to the very beginning. Thanks to this technology, we can, to this approach, we can create a digital model that can be shared among all the other designers and stakeholders. And these digital models gives you at least three big advantages. Control of the costs, control of the time, and reduce the risk. We will talk about the risks later during the round table. And because I want to hear, I want to hear from our guests why we are why we uh, why I'm talking about the risk why I'm talking about developers and how to reduce the risk this would be a very important topic and I look forward to hearing from the speakers and also from our, our audience what they think about since we have a digital model we can say what you draw is what you get you see something on the screen you get that element on site. In the 90s, it was what you see is what you get. But now in 2022, it is time to go for what you draw is what you get, exactly as it happens with the 3D printers. And this is a big, big revolution in the building industry once we, under, once we understand how it works once we understand all the advantages connected to this approach, to this technology. So, let's go to the speakers. I'm very, very, very excited to announce all the speakers one by one. For those who follow us on, uh, on LinkedIn, they already know who are they, but now you see them on the map. We will start with, with Patrick Krabbe from Canada, then we will move to Australia with Paul Kramer. We will move again back to the East Coast in North America with John Klein. Then back to Europe, Philip Thunbrunen will be the next guest. And the final one will be Greg Hose. And then all together back to Europe. So be ready for this uh, trip around the world and uh, I could say fasten your belts and uh, enjoy this meeting. So now you see all the speakers and uh, the first one will be Patrick Rabe. We met uh, a few months ago, a few weeks ago actually in Toronto and uh, I was amazed by his vision about CLT. He told me, well, Franco, I will speak more about what is happening in North America. Okay, we are ready and uh, very excited to listen to your point of view, Patrick. Please. Great, thank you, Franco. What, a, what an exciting introduction and good day to everyone across the world. And uh, again, Franco, thank you for the opportunity uh, to, to present on this, this global platform. So I guess I will go ahead and get started here. So my name is Patrick Crabb and I am the director of Mass Timber for a Canadian general contracting company called Bird Construction. Uh, we're one of the top five largest general contractors in Canada. What separates us uh, from the North American market is that we do have a very specific strategy focused on Mass Timber excellence that is 100% dedicated across the country to, to escalate this industry forward. So here's just some metrics on kind of the volume of projects that we have underway right now uh, from coast to coast, from here in Atlantic Canada, all the way over to uh, British Columbia. So we are seeing everything that's happening in the modern market and we're consolidating that under one roof with this center of excellence. So these are just kind of the main focuses of this of this center. Um, you know, what I'm going to be talking about today specifically is how 
from a North American perspective, we have had success setting up a project for success. A mass timber approach is completely different from that of conventional steel or concrete construction and how that all ties into DFMA. So I always like to start my presentation with kind of the conclusions first, uh, so that if you do happen to drop off or, or fall asleep, you know, you, you can kind of take away the key fundamentals. And this is the most critical aspect that relates directly to uh, DFMA approach, and that's that procurement, design, and construction efficiencies are found in understanding the supply chain and designing to its capabilities. So here in North America, we're kind of set up with two different buckets. We have manufacturers uh, who are producing the product, and then we have engineer and install companies that will, you know, source material from all over the world or from regional manufacturers to execute the project. And depending on which region of the of the country or, or hemisphere you're in, uh, there are different species involved, there are different manufacturing capabilities. Uh, so you really have to understand where your constraints are. And here in North America, which is kind of polar opposite to that of Europe, glue lamb tends to be our bottleneck. Just historically, how the manufacturing process and our building codes have shaped the industry, we don't necessarily have the flexibility to produce glue lamb members to support our evolving building codes. You know, here in Canada, we can build up to 12 stories. Uh, in, in the US, it's going to be 18 stories. So uh, glue lamb is really kind of the bottleneck for the full mass timber solution, where adversely in Europe, you know, it's uh, glue lamb has been around for a very long time. And now you're seeing people adding capacity on the CLT side. So this is exactly why you must understand the supply chain and design according to its uh, capabilities is because you want to have your, your product showing up on site, your structural members completely finished. You do not want to be dealing with blank members and using a chainsaw to make any modifications. This way you can truly realize the speed of construction potential and the accuracy of, of mass timber. The next key fundamental is that as, as Franco had touched on, you know, involving structural as early as possible because you want to optimize your, your, your structural uh, project and expose it architecturally. We, these, this is a great example um, of Brock Commons, which was the tallest wood building in the world at one point at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, BC. And it was more of a demonstration project. So it was just kind of an emotional decision at this point to put three layers of drywall. And this is what we want to prevent. You know, there's a lot of residential and office product out there that if there was just a, a little bit more thought and, you know, I guess resources and experts involved early on in the process, you know, you certainly could expose, uh, as I had talked about in that fundamental. So mass timber really is, I would say, perfectly aligned with the progress of how projects are being delivered in North America and across the world. We need more collaborative project delivery, more people involved, all the key stakeholders from the architects, the engineers, to the mechanical and electrical consultants, uh, to key tradespeople involved in early decision making to create this digital file uh, that, uh, that Franco has talked about. So this is just a quick snapshot at kind of the difference between a conventional project and a mass timber project is that it's very heavy upfront in design and pre-construction resources. And that is exactly, this is why, you know, the intricacies of how these projects are showing up on site, as Franco said, you know, you, you want to you wanna plan it from the finish all the way back to the start. And uh, this just goes to show how, how truly you can, you can detail and, uh, and, and realize the capabilities of mass timber efficiencies. So all of that with the fact that, you know, we're, we're all trying to strive towards net zero by 2050. So we, we need to be carbon smart about our design optimization and, and procurement structures. You know, here in North America, indigenous engagement is also very key. Uh, supply chain challenges ultimately that have evolved from, from COVID. And, you know, that has led to a lot of uh, commodity pricing volatility. So mass timber reinforces collaborative project delivery, especially as we try and balance these modern priorities. So these are kind of the key differentiators. Uh, that, that again, really support this DFMA model. 
In North America, traditionally, we have, you know, uh, our governments like to procure projects in two ways. We have a hard bid where you have an architect and an engineer working with an owner. They design the project in, in a silo and then put it out to tender for the, the contracting industry to bid. The low bid generally wins. And then it's kind of a clawback approach to uh, make the money uh, off of, uh, you know, recovering from the low bid. It's not a very collaborative process. And with mass timber being a prefabricated solution, you have to make so many decisions that can't be made on site. So it's just not conducive to this type. And we don't really need to get into design build. So in the conventional approach, we often look at the programming of a building before we even think about the structure, because we can just add more rebar to concrete. Um, we can you know, add more pounds per square foot for, for steel. So we're often recycling designs that are not conducive to you know, the natural constraints of mass timber or the production capabilities of the market. And the design objectives are not focused on exposing the structure. We have drop ceilings uh, and you know, a lot of these contingencies are just kind of blindly thrown at these projects because you know, we're not used to working in this manner. So this really feeds that, I guess, false perception of uh, mass timber cost premiums. Here's an example of some of the North American collaborative project delivery models that we really like to use. Uh, progressive design build or modified design build uh, is, is one of what I would say the most successful for mass timber. And uh, integrated project delivery is also becoming a, a very close second. I'm actually uh, here at an integrated project delivery uh, conference in, in Halifax today. So this is a, a case study example of why we want to have everyone at the table, all stakeholders, as early as possible. So the client had spent a lot of upfront time developing this design, uh, working with cost consultants to ultimately get it approved by the board. And, you know, it's kind of small here, but you can see that there was around a seven and a half meter by seven and a half meter structural grid. And within that, there was a very large purlin schedule. And we all know that the most expensive aspect of mass timber is glue lamb to glue lamb connections. So very easily, we were able to look at this project and say, based on our experience, well, we know that these grids tend to work well for mass timber and can fit the programming of an office building. So why don't we just do a little bit of a test with a six meter by 12 meter grid, see how that impacts our wood volumes and the efficiency of the programming. Well, ultimately, it made uh, the programming much more efficient. The interior designers loved it. You know, we did a footing analysis to see if we needed to add more concrete or how that would change kind of the structural loads, and it didn't. And ultimately, the glue lamb volume comparison from the original to what we have now evolved to is it saved about 50% of the volume in the project, which translates to millions of dollars. So these are the differentiators for mass timber compared to conventional. Like I said, we have a much uh, more pre-construction and design effort, which reduces construction schedule, RFIs, you know, all these change orders. But one of the challenges is, is that you have a minimum margin for error on site. Uh, glue lamb and CLT, as I touched on, the, the, the pr production capabilities differ depending on where you're at and what species you're using. Structural grid has to be considered as early as possible. And, you know, understanding the systems of why this is a, a system solution and not a conventional site-based approach. You know, engage your authorities having jurisdiction as early as possible uh, with things relative to fire uh, and, and, and code. And, and really talking to the mass timber market, it's very busy out there. So when you're planning a project, start early, develop that relationship with the individuals that are close to you uh, or ones that you want to develop a relationship with, get an idea of their capacity and timing and, and ultimately, this is the one of the more challenging ones is that we need to develop holistic estimating strategies because these are systems. And I'm just going to walk through this very quickly. You know, the, the structural cost of a mass timber building compared to conventional can be around, you know, uh, up to a 20 percent premium, depending on how optimized the grids are. And this is just an example of the holistic approach of how we can prove this value proposition to make sense, even though the structure may be a premium. So we did a schedule for this eight story, 100,000 square foot building with a concrete solution. It was around 125 days. And with a mass timber one, it was 61 days. So it translates to about three months of productivity and savings. So your value proposition is equal to kind of your schedule savings. Uh, you know, you can work your way through that formula to see truly holistically, does this solution make sense? And I'm not going to be distracted by the slight premium on the structure. Uh, moving on, we need to improve course of construction insurance premiums. 
And this is done through fire site safety planning and moisture planning mitigation. Um, here at Bird, we have a, a world class of both. And through that, we have received the most competitive insurance rates of any general contractor in North America. Um, also, you, when you're looking at a hybrid project, let's say of a, of a steel column and beam structural solution with mass timber infill, and let's say it's a union project, you really have to look at what are those union dynamics for sequencing of operations and, and how they can be impacted. Uh, Franco mentioned this and, you know, he's the best to talk about it and we're partnered on a very interesting pursuit here uh, in, in Canada and it's all about, you know, that digital capability up front, leveraging the tools that we have today to maximize the accuracy and uh, speed of construction efficiency of mass timber. And the last one is really cataloging your alternate uh, solution strategies and pathways that kind of really push the envelope for exposing mass timber and uh, you know, uh, pushing the classifications of where mass timber should be accepted, like in hospitals or certainly in high-rise residential projects. So with that, um, you know, we we're, we're certainly evolving this industry at an incredible rate. Uh, you know, industry adaptability for construction over time has always been kind of flatlined. You know, now that we're seeing uh, you know digital tools as well as alternative uh, construction products like mass timber coming on. It's, it's certainly starting to increase uh, exponentially. So I would think that, you know, with the wonderful work that Franco has done to, to bring these world-class experts here today, you know, we're certainly pushing that uh, market acceptance uh, over time at a rapid rate. So thank you everyone for your time and attention and uh, re really appreciate this opportunity. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Beautiful presentation and uh, I know that you have to leave to your uh, conference and uh, you will not be there for the Q&A time, maybe, hopefully, uh, if you'll maybe. be there, there we, we, will, we will have some questions for you as well. So, um, one quick thing before moving to the next one, Dave, the full event uh, will be available on YouTube for free for everyone next week. I cannot tell you when exactly. So please follow us on LinkedIn or keep following us on LinkedIn on our company page, Agudomus Timber Engineering. Um, you will see uh, as soon as the, we will post, uh, we will create a specific post as soon as the video will be available on YouTube. And now I'm happy to move on the other side of the world, as we say down there for uh, um, uh, to go to Australia and very welcome to uh, to Paul Kramer. Paul, thank you, thank you very much. I know it is uh, 12.30 a.m. where you are, so you must be very late. I, but I know that the title of your uh, presentation is really crazy. So please, Paul Kramer, <laughs> It's you. Thank you. Thanks, Franco. And uh, as I normally say on the podcast, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, and I'm very, very pleased to present to you. So once the slides come up, um, I'll certainly be able to give you a bit of an expose. So building off the back of what Patrick's been saying, um, I'm going to delve a little bit deeper into what DFMA means in terms of manufacturing sense and look at a thing called the kit of parts and see how that builds up. Um, just a quick note, if you haven't listened to the podcast, uh, jump onto the Mass Timber Construction podcast, you'll be able to hear everything that I've been talking about um, in these sorts of slides and uh, meeting great guests from all over the world. Let's get into it. So design for manufacture and design for assembly are the two key concepts which sit within uh, DFMA. Um, and they actually were born from two simple approaches, which is how do you design for manufacture and how do you design for assembly, which fits beautifully within a manufacturing sense from a mass timber producer and how you might actually assemble it with someone like Bird and Patrick's team and how that might actually play out on site. And the basic premise of this is taking something quite complex, which is the image on one side, and then trying to reduce the number of parts or try to make it more simplified um, on the other side. And in the middle, you can actually see the DFMA process. So design, review, redesign, and then review again. So it's a cyclic process that allows you to be able to create something more simplistic 
And the more simplistic and the easier it is to manufacture, the more efficient that it will actually be for you in the long run. Um, so prefabricated technology, a kit of parts. So if we've got these parts, as you saw in the last slide, and they all fit together, you might end up with a library such as this. Uh, you might have things like uh, kitchen pods or uh, bathroom pods or wall claddings or stair systems or cores or cassette floors, etc. And if you start to build these up into shapes, you start to get buildings. You might have steel, concrete or timber. And in fact, timber's place alongside steel and concrete is becoming more and more frequent. And so hybrid buildings are coming from that. And the, I guess the design that you use in the digital twin, so we've heard a lot about digital twin. We've heard a lot about how do we create this building in a unique way to be able to visualize it digitally. And then that's what we end up getting on site. And so DFMA has a place to play in not only the design, but also the performance of the building. So dampening systems, which sit atop of the lighter weight construction in timber, for example. And then floor systems, how do we run services through? What is the structure going to be between the floor and the ceiling and between those floors as you go up through the building and the structure? And you need to consider all of these as a part of a design process and how those junctions, vertical and horizontal connections will work and how they might work with fire. And then what's the construction sequence and how do they all come together in concert with each other? Let me just go through. And then you've got your exoskeleton, your facade. You know, what is the geometry going to be like? If the core itself is standard, how does the architect express the unique way that they wish to have the building portrayed in the marketplace? And it can be with the facade elements and using an intergenerational change of um, techniques, uh, colors, shapes, etc. And then you can create this unique building but in essence, in its inside, it's just made up of that kit of parts that we saw at the very, very start. And here it comes together. Um, you may have, you're, you're certainly not going to have a, a basement that's made out of timber. So your car parks are generally going to be concrete um, with column spacings that are, give the most efficient use for the car parking. And then you build up to a transfer deck. That transfer deck might hold your construction above it, which may be a mass timber building. And then they, all the elements within that building come together as a system and solution. Um, I would be very uh, concerned if you were able to produce these particular elements in uh, a very, very efficient manner, given they have castellated joints between them, which can take a considerable amount of time on site, um, sorry, in manufacture, um, but work together quite well on site and work together quite well seismically. So you need to think about how you're going to put your building together and how you cut your elements. And those elements then go together with potentially this is a glue lamb structure with CLT floor systems. And then you can see the cords are already sitting at the center of the building. And then your facade elements come through and then your decorative elements that sit on the outside, whether they be perforated sheets or some sort of other facade element for decorative purposes. And of course, in the very end, you create the mass timber building itself. Um, fantastic image. Let's see where it fits in terms of an assembly process. So it fits within construction um, in the, not necessarily just the offsite construction, but also automated manufacturing. And here you can see two columns, um, offsite construction, automated fabrications or manufacturing at the top. And then you have your modular assemblies and then your automated configuration. And the very, very bottom, it's the DFMA of construction. So all of these elements need to be considered when you're actually thinking about DFMA in a construction sense. And at the very heart of DFMA, you have surrounding that the offsite construction, the automated, the automated configuration and manufacturing and the assembly um, of the modular elements. And then you have around that the industrialized construction, mass customization, DFMA is a quadrant in there or a, a segment of it, and then component based manufacturing and then direct to tooling. So this is information that sits within a digital fabrication framework. Um, so DFMA is a really a holistic way of looking at how you might actually um, manufacture in the factory for construction on site.
And the supply chain has a part to play in this as well. Um, so uh, if you have a look at where it sits, manufacturing for CLT sits in the middle, but there's this ecosystem all the way up to architecture, engineering, across to the primary producing in the forestry, and then all the way down to construction. So we need to make sure that we support levels of technology that support the conversations between all these parties. They need to then provide an education and documentation, and that can be done through research and reports. And we need to listen to members of these communities and we need to then accelerate the technology as an ecosystem of supply, not just at one end, but at least three or four points along the supply chain to be able to make it work. Activating the supply chain is really important. And as we heard Patrick say, you know, the 30% savings, probably what we're really looking for if we can get prefabrication construction done correctly with um, uh, comparison to traditional. But if we actually start to look at it in a different way and think about how these platforms of technology and the platforms of people come together in unison and then create these efficiencies, I actually think the next goal for us is how do we get an extra 30% in the design phase? And I think that's through things like creating libraries, kits of parts that might sit in Revit, using cloud technology to be able to um, share FFE um, information, so fixtures, finishings, equipment, etc., that might sit inside these particular buildings as well, which could all form part of um, the Revit libraries and, and typologies. And then how do we get all of the people using the same version, for example, and using things like HSB CAD, which then provide a digital fabrication framework to be able to go from designer all the way through to manufacturer. And that also helps the sequencing for the constructors on site. And if we have a look at the process and we take that simple concept of a rotary type item where you have an iteration between what you're designing, reviewing it, redesigning, reviewing it again, and that happens not only with your kit of parts, but your building itself, then you start with your design concept um, on one side of the slide there. You have your design for assembly in the middle and you have your design for manufacture at the end. And it's the iterations between that that are really important. Across that, you have all your construction standards, your engineering, architecture, performance. Then you have your digital twin. And then what sequence will it be manufactured and how will it end up on site? And here is a uh, typology of, I guess, the degree of integration from um, various types of technology in the prefabricated sense. Um, you've got off-site and on-site sitting on the um, uh, y-axis. On the x-axis, you've got a degree of integration. And we start from anything that starts with lining, precast concrete, and we go all the way up to full volumetric units, which are pre-finished uh, volumetric units included in that. And you'll see timber systems sits within the blue, which is the structural stream. And it follows the line from precast structural steel systems into timber panelized systems, and then it can go right through to full volumetric systems. So understanding the place of um, materials like timber and panelized systems in the ecosystem is really important for moving forward in our understanding to drive a different change in construction and manufacturing. But the supply chain is limited to what we bring and the intelligence to which we bring it. So the more people you can get involved that actually have some sensibility about what's happening in the supply chain, especially around DFMA, will support a better outcome for all. And those outcomes, I think, in many instances, uh, the 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 I guess the lack of penetration of the technologies that go through the supply chain. And um, the digital twin requires full detailing. If you don't have full detailing, it's very, very difficult to get a digital twin up. Clash detection, speeding up the process of design, speeding up the process of manufacturing could be included. Interoperability issues. So between Revit, Global, um, Tecla, et cetera, then back again. Are you all using the same version of Revit or not? And then a lack of understanding about the tolerance of materials and machine fabrication. I don't know how often it has been that um, I often see the, the roof sitting above, you know, a building structure by a couple of inches when the requirement from a manufacturing perspective is that they actually sit on top and you have millimetre tolerances rather than inches tolerances. But I think the last part here is what happens when it all goes wrong? 
And here's a really interesting curve. This is Poulsen's curve from 1976. And if you actually have a look here on the y-axis, he has the level of influence. This is the level of influence over your project or your design. And then the bottom is the project time. And in that first column, you have high influence, low expenditure. So that's high influence over the level of design and low expenditure if you make changes. And as you can see, there's a decreasing line of influence and there's an increasing line of expenditures. So what this graph is really saying is, as you move along in project time, you have a decreasing amount of influence over your project and design. So your DFMA capability starts to diminish. And at the same time, as you have this lower level of influence, the expenditure actually changes and it costs you more to influence your project over time. And that's more modernly being compared to, um, uh, you know, if you are reading, I guess, this particular information way down the other end of the project that you're working on currently, it's probably too late. And this is the reason why it's probably too late. The freedom of change, which, which is the yellow line, um, which says that, you know, you've got a capacity to make changes on your design and the knowledge of the design behavior, which is the green line, which goes up over the top and your knowledge increases as time goes on. But the red line comes through and says, you know, the cost to change, especially beyond that production date line, which is sort of the date line that you need to have full final frozen drawings and details in order for a manufacturer to manufacture it the cost of change beyond that line as you go towards your design process and into your project is extremely high so i hope that gives you a bit of a, a, an analysis of um, what's going on with dfma but what happens when you get it right well We've got these amazing plug-in tools. And so we can use these tools. I know Franco's a very, very big fan of using plug-in tools. And if we do get it right, we can start to do amazing things. And I guess the Ulbricht Tower is one of the most amazing buildings I've ever seen using the natural form of timber plus BIM in its entirety to create this amazing project. And it has some of the most incredible architecture using the contorted and twisted ways of timber and it's just a blessing to actually be able to see it and come to fruition. Uh, and if you do get a chance to go and see it, go and get a picture taken inside that very large opening. So when you do get it right, it looks amazing. And I think that's the thing we need to take away is that when we do plan and we do execute well and we've got our ducks in a row beautiful things can happen there's my details there and if you're listening on a weekly basis uh, to the mass timber construction podcast thank you very much um, also the international association for mass timber construction is available when taking membership and we're doing some amazing things we're about to release an international standard on how you define a mass timber construction building. And if you are a researcher and you wish to publish a paper, um, yeah, please come to the Mass Timber Construction Journal. So Franco, thanks very much for the invitation and I hope you enjoyed this very quick, short snippet into DFMA. Wow, Paul, thank you very much. A lot of inputs, a lot of interesting things, a lot of new keywords to add to my, to my list, which is getting almost endless. So I really uh, like uh, what you're doing, uh, what you've been doing for years, Paul, uh, promoting the CLT and the, the use of mass timber all over the world. The mass timber journal is something great on the market, available for free on LinkedIn again. And uh, what you've been doing for the organization, you and Philip together, IAMTC is great. And uh, I would like to talk, to, to talk with you about that. But um, we will do it during the, the, the round table uh, later with Philip. And I was impressed by the Paulson curve. So I look forward to, to knowing more about that. Okay, Excellent. now it is Thank you. time. Thank you again, Paul. Thank you. Thank you again, Paul. And well, I should say good night. <laughs> it's <is> very late. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Uh, now we move to the next one, uh, which is John Klein from Boston, from uh, from North America, East Coast, and uh, 
the um, uh, Pat both Patrick and Paul uh, said uh, many times the word digital, digital model, digital twin. Uh, uh, how can this technology help us to improve the quality of our buildings, to improve the quality of our designs? And John has something really new, really unbelievable to show us. So, John, very welcome, and uh, it's it's time for you to, to show us what you what you've been doing. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Franco and team, for the opportunity to and, and share our work. Um, I apologize, I'm a little under the weather, so my voice is a little uh, mumbly, but I'll try my best uh, to, uh, to share our work. Um, so as Franco mentioned, my name is John Klein, I'm the CEO of Generate. Uh, we're a Boston-based MIT spin-out tech company. Uh, and really our, our mission uh, and vision as a company is to develop and deploy digital technologies to the construction industry uh, to realize the upside uh, particularly streamline the use of sustainable building materials. And uh, for us, a significant component of that uh, is designed for manufacturing and assembly. Uh, you know, the notion of it, um, while it's uh, in the early uh, phases, we're big believers of the upside uh, by teams adopting uh, new processes, uh, particularly we think uh, implemented at scale uh, DFMA can unlock uh, the construction industry's potential to deliver more sustainable, uh, innovative, and beautiful buildings for cities, and that's where we're really passionate uh, about as a technology company. Um, let's see here. And so Generate, you know, our, our work uh, really was incubated in MIT where we built a world-class industry consortium of local and global collaborators uh, from architects, engineers, manufacturers, builders, uh, and, and folks uh, from supply chain installers um, to really develop and research a catalog of building solutions with a primary focus on the North American market um, that were influenced by design, manufacturing, and constructability parameters. Uh, and for us, a big, a big effort of, you know, going back to the mission of, um, you know, developing technologies and that, that help evolve processes, um, open source solutions are of high value uh, and we're a big believer in that and so we're currently heads down building uh, a technology platform that i'll uh, give a, a little bit uh, more information or more information on um, with the intent of taking a lot of these open source building solutions uh, creating standards and allowing folks across industries uh, to utilize them and streamline uh, the design and projects and so here, what you can see on the screen now is just a, a, a snapshot of some of these catalogs. Um, and, uh, you know, starting from low rise hybrid solutions using NLT or CLT or DLT with conventional light frame construction, and then moving up to the mid rise domain, which we see in a lot of uh, the US cities over here, uh, it's that kind of missing middle, um, you know, from the seven to uh, 12, 15 story range that a lot of cities are seeking uh, economical solutions. So here you can see a, you know, going from hybrid uh, load bearing wall structure to uh, getting in the type four uh, B and type four C eight story domain with light gauge metal walls uh, and CLT floors over steel podiums, and then advancing to uh, CLT cellular. Uh, and I'll show examples of these uh, case studies. Uh, using CLT for the walls, floors, and roofs, a, a pretty common model over in Europe, and then going to frame-like solutions and hybrids all the way up to uh, steel. And so here uh, is just an example you could see of the uh, software being used to take a design option, take an existing site. Uh, this is a real project, uh, collaboration with Place Taylor that's going under construction in Boston, and uh, actually adapt the building to a, a non-uniform site uh, and then take a lot of the uh, manufacturing information that was embedded in that uh, initial open source system and fit it as best solution as possible to the given site. And what we found is there's significant uh, time savings to do that with, as an architect, starting with a system in mind, uh, and then obviously the project brief and goals, 
Uh, and if that system has intelligence in terms of the way it could be competitively bid or procured or built or assembled, um, there's there's enormous upside. And we were able as a, as a pretty lean team to uh, take on over a million square feet of projects uh, in the greater uh, Northeast area. So here you can see the, the catalog as well. Um, this is a collaboration with Borough Huppold uh, Engineering uh, and studying the, the carbon implications as well, which is becoming increasingly uh, more common in conversations with owners and developers. And I think particularly a lot of these systems, either modular or mass timber, um, have enormous upsides in terms of the efficiency gains of, of the assembly suite sequence, but the way that um, we're able to present them to other stakeholders and decision makers on the team, uh, not only the efficiency gains, but the carbon implications for some of these uh, industrial engineered wood products are quite significant, as you see here, going from a conventional composite concrete and steel to concrete all the way down to a full CLT cellular. Uh, we found there's a significant uh, upside in terms of the kilogram per CO2 equivalent of, uh, of carbon. So now showing a couple example case studies, uh, and this was a, a consortium, a really incredible consortium we built here from Niles Bolton Associates, a very large architecture firm, uh, uh, SGH engineers led by Jeff Langwa, um, Sean Lee Construction, Code Red Consultants, and uh, Traverke, developing a series of these systems and applying them on case study projects. Uh, this one was called the Highlight, the kind of hybrid uh, approach of CLT floors with light or light gauge load bearing walls. And you can see the upside on the inside where you have um, the exposed uh, CLT, you have larger ceilings as opposed to a conventional uh, open web truss, which would be used here. Um, and you get a good balance of architectural uh, character from the timber to the, uh, the walls on the inside. And now going into the uh, uh, sort of design plan, uh, working with Niles Bolton and others from the team, looking at optimizing the units, because that's really where you, know, you want to start with some of the parameters uh, uh, that are governed by installation, how many cranes could be used, what are the amount of pick points or picks um, for, for loading on some of these units. So trying to understand that and develop a catalog of unit types and then aggregate them and assemble to optimize piece count um, as you can see here with laying out CLT panels, there was an enormous upside of only having uh, a small subset of, of panel families that then could be brought to a variety of manufacturers um, and, and competitively bid with a small amount of, of tuning. Um, and then you could see some adjustments for the uh, CLT core shafts uh, as well and stair shafts in the project. And so these kind of integrated kits or these integrated parts uh, and components um, that are assembled into the design. And just a couple other images of this system on the project, uh, the project in Boston. So now going to another one that's uh, going through permitting now, it's received variances and it's a really interesting system, a collaboration with Place Taylor um, using that CLT cellular uh, that's going under construction here in Boston this summer. Uh, just a couple images showing the irregularity of the site uh, and then how the project we really tried to take one of these uh, solutions, the CLT cellular solutions, and then adapt them um, into the uh, complicated site area, but trying to maintain enough consistency while having some customization. So this is where it became really interesting for us, where we try to optimize the bays as much as possible uh, in the plan and try to carry that grid all the way up to the building to have that uh, same reduced amount of uh, uh, part count that I mentioned in the prior uh, system and project. Uh, and this is just that example, again, showing the assembly sequence. So the cores going up first, uh, the shear walls, the floors, integrated bathroom pods, prefabricated facades uh, going up um, floor by floor. Uh, and this is something we are really excited about that's going to move forward here in the greater Boston area uh, this year a couple shots of um, some of the flexible co-working space on the interiors and a view looking down towards uh, downtown, the city area of Boston. 
So moving up uh, in scale, looking at the type 4 seat category, looking at a post beam and plate system. And, you know, to highlight why, why not have one solution for everything, what we found is there's no silver bullet for every type of uh, project in the height and scale categories, in the type of um, construction, whether it's residential, mixed use. And so that, I think that's the big challenge with DFMA is coming up with a, uh, a catalog uh, or a kit of parts that allow adaptability and versatility uh, and allow uh, as much as we can to create standardization, but also enable customization. Uh, at the same time. And so here's an example of taking that frame system on another project in Boston um, and coming up with uh, a strategy to accommodate a diverse group of unit types. In this case, it was 100% affordable housing. Uh, there's a lot of great projects here in the city uh, under that, uh, under that um, uh, standard. And then optimizing as much in the plan, but also the section of the building of how the integrated prefabricated bathroom pods can be aligned with the beams and the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing chases uh, aligned with also the framing lines and the prefab facades, how they could be aligned. And then uh, ultimately how the building can uh, reduce the uh, concrete in the foundation and trying to optimize those touch points. Uh, and a lot of work we're doing uh, in terms of building out the design software, it's really in the beginning is built uh, for uh, architects, is allowing rapid design uh, optioneering. Uh, what we found that's important for, um, you know, one of the slides earlier about design review, redesign review, I thought that was a great slide. Uh, our hope is to enable uh, or build the software that enables that kind of process and workflow to test different systems, to take one system and, and fork it and, and modify into a couple different variations to find the optimal solution to unlock the site's development potential for the architect's client and ensure that it could be competitively bid with supply chain. And so just to close out on the final projects here, um, another that sort of frame system being adapted uh, on a lab building uh, here in Boston, and the same kind of concept of having really focusing on rhythm and repetition uh, to standardize the piece count, but then having moments on the facade where you can have these notches and cuts that add, uh, you know, increase in cost and time, but create that variation to avoid homogeneity of these, um, you know, kit apart systems. And here you can see the repetition of the bays, the integrated lab space, which is a big market coming up here in the, in the Northeast. And again, taking that standard kit of parts and showing that particular with mass timber, uh, you could use CNC to create custom profiles that create uh, a whole new possibility uh, for architectural expressions. And the final project is showing uh, going up in scale, working uh, with Niles Bolton and Burrow Huppold uh, and StructureCraft. Um, using these systems and expanding to a 12 story, the uh, type 4B, uh, and then actually working with members of the steel industry, coming up with a hybrid solution. In this case, a company called Girder Slab that makes a slim floor beam, uh, developing an approach where uh, the steel system could be prefabricated. And then we have these uh, CLT components, which uh, the steel uh, unions could also erect as part of the uh, structure. We found that to be a very effective system, particularly here in the um, uh, Northeast, where steel is a pretty big uh, common solution. And again, looking at uh, optioneering and processes to enable optioneering, comparing those design systems and comparing the different heights and areas to come up with the best building solution as possible. So I'll close out there um, and just want to share that uh, for those uh, folks out there that are interested in learning more and being a part of developing and, and designing with these open source solutions would encourage you to go to generate.design and sign up. We're in private uh, stealth mode at the moment, but we have a lot of exciting things that we're planning, or planning to release uh, towards the later half of the year. Um, and thank you so much. Thanks to you, John. Thank you very much. And um... Yeah, I remember we met uh, in Portland at the Mass Timber Conference. Uh, there was also Paul uh, and, uh, and Philip and Greg. So that was one of the biggest and most interesting event of the 2022. Um, yeah. I know that you stay here with us uh, until the end uh, for the question time. So please, uh, uh, to the uh, we have more than 200 people connected on three uh, different channels. Feel free to uh, 
type comments, uh, ask uh, questions uh, for um, for the roundtable uh, we will have at the end. Uh, now I'm very uh, very happy to welcome another friend uh, from uh, from Europe. Now we move from uh, East North Amer from North America East Coast from Boston. We move to uh, UK, where we have uh, my friend Philip Thumbrun. I remember Philip uh, that we met uh, in London a couple of years ago before COVID. And uh, during a conference, you said that the timber engineers are simply different than the other uh, engineers because they are different. We are different, I can say. <laughs> we think different. So I'm very, very happy to, um, I can't wait to see your presentation. And uh, yeah, please, now it's you. Perfect, thank you very much. And um, good afternoon or good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm, I hope my presentation comes up quite quickly. As Franca said, we are, um, yeah, I say we timber engineers are different. Um, I think it also stems from we work with the FMA for quite a long time. Um, myself, I'm a trained carpenter first and then became a timber engineer. Therefore, for me, the FMA was already a thing before I even know that this is existing. And I think we should also remember the FMA is nothing new. It is, it's quite an old definition, which, which comes from the industry, car industry and other manufacturers. And I think we are moving more away from construction. We are moving more onto assembly. We assemble stuff. We don't, we don't construct stuff on site. We put stuff together. And I think that is a, it's a really important thing. So I would, good, oops, sorry. Um, yeah, just quickly, I want to tell you a little bit what we are doing at Urban, um, a bit the FMA, and then I would like to show you how we use it. For me, it's really important. It's the assembly where I focus most. How do we get it together on site? And programming is, is extremely important. Um, Urban is a specialist timber engineer. We're a consultant on one side, but we're also specialist subcontractor delivering mass timber uh, structures all over the world um, since 2003. That means we are turning 20 next, next year. We have done over 350 projects, mainly in the UK, but also um, more and more projects now overseas, North America, um, Asia, um, and, and other parts of the world. For us, really, the timber is is the, is, is the most important thing, but the digital construction, the design is really important. We we use BIM and the FMA since, yes, it's really since the beginning, and that's extremely important for us. I can't move my, my slides forward, but um, hopefully I'm getting that connection back pretty soon. Okay. Oops. So good. Um, we have um, we have two offices. Our headquarters is in London, and we have a um, another office, a branch in Switzerland, to also to, br to bring us closer to the people which manufacture our material. Because in the UK we don't really have a lot of mass timber manufacturers. We employ um, timber engineers, project designers, project manager, and construction managers. That's really for us important to have the, the full view on it um, and that's I think the, mo the most important thing. We, our business sits on three pillars, the design, the manufacture and the assembly and I think that brings you back to design for manufacture and assembly and that's really important also to have the closed loop. I think people call talk about the golden thread at the moment, how can we improve um, the, the quality, how can we have the, the responsibilities and the, um, of the different parts of a building, of the different stages of the construction, more under one roof, or also have this, have this circle, have this golden thread, because it is responsibility, it is quality, and for us, the golden thread should be an opportunity to drive 
all around quality to make better buildings, buildings which will which will perform better for the for the users, but also for the environment. And therefore, what is also important is the shared duty of care. And what I mean with that is not just move um, responsibilities away. It is really to make sure that what we do is is fix. Is that everybody knows what he, what everybody needs to do, and therefore we have this responsibility matrices for that everybody can see what is his duty. Um, as I said, we have a lot of experience. We do we do most of our projects in the UK and a lot of them in in London. They 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 vary in shape and form from multi-story residential buildings to really small single-family houses, schools and all kinds of buildings. And I think what it means is with Mass Timber, CLT and Glulam, we can build all these kinds of buildings and DFMA is always there. Whatever we do, if we build a small single family house or a big multi-story building, it is always DFMA, BIM, the design from, from the beginning to the end is vital to make the building a success. And here again, some images of different buildings um, we do a lot of school buildings, but also multi-story residential, um, especially before Grand Valley. It was a bit easier now. We need to integrate a little bit more with the fire. And that's, a, that's an important thing for us. Now, DFMA, I think Franca described to you what it is. Um, for us, is thinking about the project delivery from the start. Well, Paul explained about um, production. And, but for me, it's really, it's the whole thing. How do we assemble it again? And I think that's what Paul said as well. We think about first, how we put it together. That maybe comes a little bit down to my background as a carpenter. We always thought about how do we install this beam? How do I put the nails in? How do I put the screws in? And that's important. Collaborative working because we need to design it for our manufacturers. We need to design it for the users. We need to design with the architect in, in mind, and it is a different way. That's why we're talking about assembly and not about construction. It's a different kind of construction. And in the timber industry, I would say, we are doing it since a long time, because traditionally we design it, we manufacture, and then also we, we have to put it together. Therefore, it's, it's really important to think about that and lift the FMA. And, and here again, it's not just the planning, how do we deliver it, how do we manufacture it? I think more and more, it also comes in, how do we disassemble? Because we need to, our buildings, they, when they come to the end of their life, what do we do with the building? The best thing is always to reuse it, to recycle it. And therefore we need to be able to maybe take parts off or take the whole building apart. I'm not saying we need to design everything that we can move it after 15 years. We should really make buildings which are there for a long period of time and not just for for a few years. That's it's really important. And if we think about the FMA, that's also part of it. And if you don't believe in it, I think you're in the wrong place. Um, as this picture shows, if you do, I don't believe in global warming. I think then, yeah, you're in you're on the wrong planet. I'm sorry. And this is also a slide which um, Paul showed before. It's really, when do we have the opportunity? When, do, when can we make changes without a, a massive cost impact? And that most of it we can do in the preparation, talking to the client before we even start designing. Because as soon as we start designing, we incur in cost. And then if we need to change stuff on site, then it costs you a lot of money. And I would like to show you a short example of one of the projects where for me, the, without the FMA and without digital construction, we wouldn't be able to build this. This is the North Stowe Education Campus, um, which is located north of Cambridge. It's quite a big project, as you can see on this CGI. Um, in total, it's about 15,000 square meter or 161 square foot of school building. It's 4,750 cubic meter of mass timber. And this is just the first phase um, of this new campus on a greenfield site. We're talking about three buildings, an energy center, an SCN school, a secondary school, including the sports center. 
And the crazy thing here with this project is we got the inquiry in January 2018 and we knew the main contractor has to hand over part of the school in September 2019. Therefore, we only had 20 months from inquiry to hand over of the first bit, not the whole school. But that really has driven the whole thinking about how do we program that? And I think that is also comes a little bit to that. We have a start point and we have an end point, and then we have to look at it from the end. Well, we had that. We had the inquiry phase. We, we we got an we we supplied an offer, and then we got a letter of intent, and that was a three month period. Therefore, of the twenty month, we lost already three. We only had seventeen month. Okay, but the handover date stays. Therefore, the first thing is how long do we need for the assembly of this project? How long do we need to hand over our bit? that the main contractor can finish it. As you can see here, we knew by June 2019, we need to be able to hand over that to give them three months to finish it. As soon as we had the idea, how long do we need on site, then the next part comes in and it's about, oops, it's about, sorry. It's about the production and the, the production information creation, the procurement of the project. And then you, you start stacking the stuff up on top of each other. And that's also the FMA. It's not just producing drawings. It's also producing a program. And that's the most important thing. How do we do that? And this created us then the time. How much time do we have for design? Which wasn't that much. It was only six months from start. Then we needed to sign off from the whole team to give us enough time to produce the information to procure everything, procure the glue lamp, the CLT, the fixings. And I think you shouldn't underestimate the amount of fixings you need on a project like that. And there, yeah, programming is part of it. But the other part of the whole DFMA approach is how do we put it together? How do we bring people together to work with each other? Or well, you have a whole list here, architect, concrete engineer, timber engineer, which was us, m and &E, the main contractor, the different contractor, our different suppliers, you have to work with them. And just to give you a little feel for it, how big the project is, well, this one here, this is the small energy center, the first building. And when you look at the, at the renderings, that is really this small building, which looks like a small box. Um, but apparently this small box, if you compare it to the crane, and the door height here is three meters. Therefore, the, the building was about eight meters tall and it was about 13 meters wide. Therefore, it isn't a small building. It's quite big, but compared to the other ones. And again, I would just like to show you a little bit how, how do we think about designing it. And this is for, for BIM as well as for the FMA. It's, it's really interacting with each other. Or we have the different stages in the UK, the RIBA stages, for a project and everybody, every architect, everybody knows how that works. We overlay that with say our storyboard. How do we produce it? Well, we start with the design, then we develop the design together with the architects. We have, this, we have these meetings internally, externally. We have data exchanges, design freeze. This is really the BIM part, but then it becomes the production, the technical design, and then in parallel, how do we deliver it, logistics, and how do we con construct it? How do we assemble the parts on site? That's really important. And that this is what you have to think about from the beginning. Just a short thing. I don't want to talk really about BIM, but for me, the most important thing about BIM and the design collaboration is how do we exchange our, our information, drawings, 3D models, and yeah, we have great 3D models and it's absolutely amazing, but we need to go back and we need to talk to each other. For me, there are really important questions. We need to ask each other, what do I need? But also, and what do I don't, what I don't need? What can I do or what can you do and what not? What do I really want from this? What, what information do I want? 
and what I don't want, because it makes no sense if I get models with furniture. That's not for me. We don't need this. Um, and, and sorry, just to go back on that, it's also important to ask what can you do and what you can't do, because it makes no sense to push somebody into a position. And I think these are really simple questions which we need to ask each other to have a proper collaboration, and therefore we have a much better, smooth process. And you see a lot of these really nice CGIs. They are, they're nice, but what information is in there, what is important for us, it's the m &E. Where are the holes through the structure? I don't need this whole um, fancy 3D model. I'm sorry, the slides are going back. Um, and therefore, a lot of our coordination is still on 2D drawings, on sketches, hand sketches are powerful. It doesn't mean if you want to do DFMA, that everything needs to be in a 3D model and everything needs to be really complicated. It's really the, as, much as, as much as needed, but as little as possible. And what is really needed? Of another thing, what is really important in part of the FMA is the free, it's the 4D planning. It's the, it, how do we install the buildings? Or you can see here, it's, it's quite the big project. All the red stuff is phase one. And then on the, on the right hand side, you can see the buildings with the different crane position, the temporary roads on side and stuff like that is, is much easier to demonstrate in a 3D model or here with all the different crane positions. We also produced a really short and really simple video um, for, for, for this. I'm not sure, I don't think it goes, but hey, -ho, I can show you that on the, on the, on the images on side or oh, we have, this is the first building, Desian School, where we started in February. You can see not all the concrete is done. It's it's really it's it's all together and really close with each other because there is so much to do. There was, there was so much so little time, and therefore the planning, the logistics on site, the, the design for assembly, but also the design for for follow-on trades is extremely important. All we have with we have CLT deliveries coming in. We have concrete deliveries coming in as well. And it gets busier and busier. As you can see, as we walk through the months, or you have already out the deliveries of materials. And, and that's more or less halfway through, where we install on one part of the building, and on the other part, the roof is already on. Because that's important. We can't just build this massive big CLT building and then leave it out in the rain. And not making use of the opportunity to be really fast to have to follow on trades in oh, you can see here again a lot of other deliveries we have then two cranes on site that needs to be coordinated as well and scaffolding following us brickwork and all the different trades oh, and this is stuck this is on the end in july when we finish that part of the building as you can see in some corners, the building is more or less finished outside. Windows are already installed and they started inside. On the bigger part on the, on the secondary school, it was, even, it was even more complicated because it was much bigger and we had, we had much, more, um, much more deliveries from our side, but also from the follow-on trades. In addition, we started with two cranes. At the high point, we had, we had five cranes on this building. Mm -hmm. You can see here with three cranes, the health and safety, how do, you, how do you make sure that the cranes are not clashing with each other? And that's, a, that's really a task and that's part of the DFMA. And you can see here this building going up. And yeah, it's the manufacturing, it's the logistics, and it's the on-site assembly. And I think for me, that is really the, the whole part of DFMA. And here you can see building nearly complete and here just installing the last few bits and that's how the building looks on the end um yeah with different finishes on the outside on the inside there's not that much timber exposed in this school different usage just um all the communal areas and sports hall really big span can be easily done with clt as well and glue them um, some pools some assembly halls and again, from the outside, a lot of bricks. That's really typical for the UK. Um, just to wrap it up, for me, yes, the FMA prefabrication offsite or whatever you call it is an important part to build the buildings for our future. But the quality and longevity is important to build buildings for our children's future. 
or mass timber, and especially CLT is a massive challenge for the timber industry and the others who want to build more sustainable and serve the current demand. And DFMA is key to make this happen. It's not just the material, it's also the DFMA. How do we plan it? We are not, and something, a lot of people talk about car and aerospace and we, we should build exactly the same as the car industry. I think DFMA can also be small. We can do DFMA with hand sketches because it's the thinking, it's the approach. If you could then go really f far and have AI and really intelligent softwares, it gets better, but the thinking needs to be there. And the FMA is not just for the big one, um, because I think we also have to understand in, um, innovation usually comes from smaller players and we shouldn't be afraid. And what is big? Well, I think most, most, of, the in most of the industry players in the timber industry are really small compared to the likes of, of Google and Apple. Um, but we we can make the change. Um, and a successful start uh, project starts with the design. We have to adopt our way we design and collaborate. And yeah, for me, I'm really looking forward to my next 20 years in the timber industry. And I think it will be extremely important to continue innovating and the FMA is not a new thing. We're doing it since a long time and we have to continue it. That's thank you very much. And I'm open for the questions afterwards in the in the discussion. Wow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. Super, super inspiring. Um, and, uh, I, I really liked when you said that uh, we've been using the timber industry industry, we've been using DFMA for years without knowing that this is the DFMA. It is true. I designed my very first uh, uh, CLT building in 2003. And even at that time, we were using specific software. We were working in a quite, let's say, preliminary uh, workflow, which, is, which looks absolutely similar to the one we are using now. So it is great. And also when you said that uh, innovation comes from small players, this is true. We are, I speak about myself, uh, we are a small engineering firm, but uh, we see that small companies can really innovate, have the flexibility to innovate and to change the market in, uh, some, um, in some occasions. So thank you very much, Philip, and see you in a few minutes uh, at the round table together with all the other speakers. Talking about that, uh, we will have a special guest uh, after uh, after Greg, I cannot say you, I cannot tell you who he is, but uh, we will have another um, another um, guest uh, for the for the roundtable, and he will be from another country, so it will be really international this time. Uh, this uh, this conference, this event. Okay, so we're on time. I'm super excited, uh, more and more, getting more excited for the final speaker is my friend Greg Hose. Now we move on the west coast. We are in Oregon. We met um, at the Mastinberg conference this year in April and we also met at the Mastinberg conference in 2019. And I know Greg you inspired me many many times with your posts uh, on LinkedIn and I know we have similar ideas about the timber industry and uh, so I look for, I can't wait to, to hear from you, uh, to see your presentation, because I'm sure that you will, uh, um, you will bring something new uh, for, uh, for most of us. So please, Greg, it's your time. Okay, thanks. Can I you bring up the first slide? Hello, everyone. Okay, uh, happy to be here, Franco. I, um, thanks for organizing this. I absolutely love uh, these diverse events that bring people um, from many different perspectives and all coming uh, together. Um, to share information initially about what we do, we're a small company based in Oregon on the West Coast. And um, my 
business partner is a Swiss business partner, and essentially we're a secondary manufacturer. So we don't produce um, the, pro the initial product, uh, CLT or glue lamb. We essentially add value to it through custom fabrication to make a custom kit of parts for mass timber buildings. Uh, but Swiss Partner has been doing it since 1993, obviously initially in Switzerland. And then we've been uh, together, we've completed over a thousand buildings, not all of them mass timber buildings, but a thousand buildings in total. Um, yeah, founded in 2010. Uh, we like being on the U.S. West Coast. The If you look at California, Oregon, and Washington, that is about half of the U.S. mass timber market, just the, the number of buildings under construction. Uh, California is the biggest market, but it doesn't have significant mass timber production in the state. The majority of that is coming from out of the state, a lot of it from Oregon and Washington, where we're located. Um, even though our team is small, we're very international. Uh, when we started, we looked like, look, the U.S. is the biggest market for wood-framed buildings, uh, but we're admittedly many years behind in how mature and large the mass timber industry is in Europe, primarily Alpine Europe, and the machines and software, the majority that we use and the industry uses here in North America is from Europe, as is the majority of the experience. And we, how we look at this, I started also as a carpenter, have worked as a carpenter for many years, as has my business partner, Stefan. And then we essentially continue to push, how do we use more and more technology? How do we use the best tools and the best processes from around the world and localize them for the U.S. market to help grow the industry? And I think we'll have a slide. I want to show our CNC machine in action. I don't know how to start the video, but let's try it. Um, this is in our factory. We essentially have a Cruzy 5-axis CNC machine, a beam processor. This is our primary fabrication machine. Uh, we also, of course, cut on uh, Hundegger machines. They're far more common. They're the market leader. We actually have the only Cruzy machine in the U.S. There's also one in Canada. Um, we also cut on shop sabers, uh, again, KUKA industrial robots. It all depends on the uh, pro product in every building. I mean, the project, the building, and every building is a hybrid. There's also what we do. We don't do it alone. Uh, we have a big network of partners, everything from primary manufacturers of mass timber products to steel fabricators, and then a group of architects, engineers, and builders. Uh, the difference between the U.S. is the market is so big that on most projects we're working with at least some companies that are completely new to mass timber. And then it changes on each project depending on geography and building type. I think that makes it more challenging uh, than in a more, let's call it stable or smaller market like Switzerland. Uh, the good news is the market here is exploding and demand far, far exceeds supply. Uh, here's a current project I can show. This one is actually a custom home in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Obviously a lot of geometrical complexity. And on this particular project, uh, a lot of the cutting was actually done primarily on a shop saber. Uh, here, each of the parts, in the jack, because the geometry is complex, uh, almost all of the parts are unique parts which need to be essentially numbered and then assembled in place uniquely. Um, this, I think, is another perfect example that illustrates how not only is DFMA necessary, but how they're complementary to make a project actually work on site. If you've ever watched a TED Talk, uh, we fabricated the stage for the TED Talks, and it was assembled on site in Vancouver, Canada in less than a week. Let's see if the video plays in the next slide. This is a short video, but I think it really illustrates see, essentially what happens is, this is back in 2014, um, TED is going to happen. We have one week to assemble the entire structure. There are 12,000 individual parts 
that are assembled into what we call assemblies. So they're partially assembled before we truck them in for construction. We did a LIDAR scan, not only of the building, but during continually during the assembly. So the digital model matches the assembly. So everything can essentially be assembled on site in place. And the physical model continually matches uh, the digital model. It has to happen because $10 million worth of tickets have been sold for that event and you essentially cannot be late. And I don't think without an integrated digital process, it would be possible to pull this off no matter how many people you put at the project if everything wasn't well coordinated, planned with integrated um, fabrication and the assembly with the right team. Uh, this is unusual to actually integrate both the LiDAR scanning while you assemble, but I think it was uh, absolutely critical uh, for this project. Uh, the stage has then again been assembled every year except during the pandemic in less than a week and then taken down in three days after the TED conference and reassembled um, on site the following year. And there it is a week later, the completed project. Here's another example is we primarily focus on the, the West Coast. A lot of our projects are also in Oregon. This is another one where we essentially worked with the architect and contractor and engineer to develop a mass timber system, uh, integrating both the connectors, uh, modeling the connectors, metal fabrication, and all of the CLT and beams. And then we coordinate with a CLT producer and do the modeling. So the CLT is fabricated by CLT company. We're fabricating the beams and everything is shipped together and assembled on site. Another one, this is a massive building in Portland, just one of many awards. It's the new Adidas headquarters. That's 460,000 square feet. Uh, we fabricate a lot of the really massive beams. This was also an extremely interesting project. I think many of you may be familiar with the uh, Google spin-off Sidewalk Labs. Uh, the initial plan was to build a mass timber district in Toronto, Canada, in Keyside. And for these, they developed a prototype for 35-story buildings. And we fabricated and sourced and managed the assembly of this prototype STOA essentially the ground floor for 35-story buildings. Unfortunately, that project did not move forward. The good news is uh, Sidewalk Labs continues to be very focused on mass timber um, and is now essentially moving ahead with fabrication and their company here in Washington State. Um, this is a forest science complex. It's also a massive building. It's in uh, Corvallis in Oregon State University. Uh, big building. In the, I think the biggest uh, mass timber research center uh, in the U.S. at any university. I hope that changes and it may soon, but right now we're really happy to have a relationship and work with the Tallwood Design Institute in Oregon. Here's an example of another project. This is in uh, Washington State. Uh, this is a school on the coast of uh, Washington. And then we also do single family homes. This was a, a custom home, obviously, using CLT. Uh, it's also net zero and it's also passive house certified. This is in West Bay in uh, North Vancouver. Uh, I also wanted to show just some components. This is obviously a stairs, uh, all, all prefabricated and assembled. And this is also an unusual event project for Nike in Chicago. It essentially was a floating workout area on the water in Chicago. Another single family home. And here are some of the, this demonstrates, I think, the capabilities of having an integrated process. The kit of parts was shipped to Maui, and then the owner and two of his kite surfing friends had the entire frame up in a single week. Uh, this is a modern home, also up in Vancouver, BC. 
here's our contact information where we're based in Portland, Oregon. Uh, we're also building a new factory and intend to create a mass timber innovation cluster when our new factory uh, goes up together with some mass timber partners uh, later this year. Uh, I have a, obviously a very biased view as an actual manufacturer or fabricator. Uh, when people speak about DFMA, I like to ask, is your data or your model actually fabrication ready? And from the perspective of a manufacturer, that's critical to us. And I, what I wanted to know if a car playing consumer electronic device, steel or other component is actually ready for manufacturing or fabrication, uh, the people I generally ask are the manufacturers or fabricators themselves, and is the data machine readable by the CNC machines and robots? And I want to point out what we still have to learn. As I said, the good news is in the U.S. the market is exploding. We have shortages of individual single-family homes in numbers in the millions. Uh, demand for mass timber far exceeds supply. And that problem is growing. Uh, it's a good problem, but we do need a lot more supply. We need a lot more collaborate, collaboration in, and in digitizing the supply chain just to be able to make the projects successful. I actually saw this post uh, yesterday on LinkedIn, and it was from Sasha Shade. Um, Interesting, I wanted to point this out. Uh, they're a very successful, very impressive uh, fabricator, very large, but it shows if everything is well integrated and optimized, the blue color is showing their runtime. And at that point, 99.4%. So they are very busy and very productive, having adding value to mass timber because everything is very well integrated not only in their company, but within the larger ecosystem of partner companies they work with. Personally, I think there's enough room in the U.S. market for literally thousands, if not tens of thousands of companies focusing on different building types and in different geography. And so we're very early days. There's only dozens of companies right now, but hopefully we'll have thousands soon or even tens of thousands, and we very badly need them. Thank you. Uh, that's kind of my presentation. We've only got 20 minutes left, I believe, for the round panel discussion, so I'll finish there, and thank you for your time. Oh, and one last, oh, I do want to point out one last thing. Um, last year, I organized a Mass Timber March Madness event and posted all the videos online on YouTube uh, you can find them under Mass Timber City on YouTube, and there are 33 videos from 37 speakers, including, for example, Franco Piva. That's a great online resource sharing information about how the industry works, where innovation is heading, and very diverse perspectives. And I look forward to linking to these presentations from Franco. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. And uh, I must say that uh, you inspired me uh, with, the, with your March Madness. Uh, I was your guest and uh, I really appreciated that uh, all the video were available for free after the, uh, after the event. So I think, uh, and I also replied to one of the questions uh, I got from, uh, from Zoom. It is so, so important to be open and to share the knowledge. If we want uh, the, uh, the, 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 the building industry to move into diff to, to use different materials, to go for timber, to go for more sustainable materials, we need, we must share our knowledge. So we are perfectly on time. Thank you to all the speakers. Uh, and uh, I want to say thank you to Giorgio, who is the guy behind in the, in the control room. You don't see him, you don't hear him. But he is managing everyone, telling them, telling us what to do. Okay, three, two, one, start. So thank you, Giorgio, for the great job. And now I, I'm very happy to welcome uh, the special guest, who is uh, my friend Alan Diaz uh, from Brazil. Uh, if you can say something, Alan, just a 
few th seconds to introduce to introduce yourself and then we will start the round table with some questions i see i'm checking on my laptop zoom and then i have uh, questions on youtube and on, on linkedin i hope to manage all those three channels okay hello everyone greetings from brazil i'm very glad to be here with all this monsters uh, from uh, the mass timber industry and very glad to be among them and uh, thank you franco for the invitation it's very important what uh, we're doing here uh, sharing knowledge and talking about the fma which is very interesting because as you said we always use it the fma in our lives and now it has a name <laughs> to call it and uh Thank you, everyone. Let's uh, go for the discussion table. Thank you, Alan. Thank you very much. And uh, so um, now it's time for the for the round table. And uh, I would like to say something after these five great uh, presentations. If I had to summarize the full event with just one word, I would say digitization digital model, digital twin. Everything is now connected to the digital, to the digitization. We need uh, to use the new technologies. I'm not talking about something we will see in about 20 years, in 30 years. I'm talking about something which is real, which is now here. We can buy the software, we can buy the technology. We. I'm not saying that we need to spend billions, millions of uh, dollars of euros to buy those technologies. The most important part is our brain. We, use, we need to use our brain and to use in a proper way to implement the digital models to our workflow. So I, I have a, a lot of uh, a lot of questions, uh, and uh, one of them is: uh, Can we can we say that DFMA, uh, the DFMA is a value, is a kind of a value engineering tool to reduce the cost of the of the building, and especially to reduce the risk. Because I had uh, a few meetings with the developers in the past years, and uh, the biggest concern they have is, I'm familiar with team, with the concrete, I'm familiar with steel. I am not familiar with the timber, so I'm worried about the risks. Can the FMA reduce the risk for developers, for builders, for investors? Who wants to, uh, to take this question? This would be a question for Patrick, so maybe Philip or Greg. Yeah, I think are we... Yeah, if you want, I can, I can start with that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we, we work a lot with main contractors and developers as well. And, and for them, it is, they're risk adverse. They want to move, remove risk. And therefore, if we can show them a 3D model, um, if we can show them proper drawings and, and take them on the journey through the design, they are much more comfortable. Maybe the first time they're still a bit worried and they're, like they're walking on eggshells but i mean afterwards they can see that and they can they learn with it it's a learning process and there is also more trust in in these models i think quite often we show them the the, the digital part but also show them real examples and i think that is important a lot of people are also anxious about just trusting the digitalization i think that's for me digital and crafts need to come together and, and that's really what the FMA is, because what you said, Franco, is absolutely right. The best software doesn't really work if we don't have the humans behind who know how to do it. We have to teach the software. And that's, for me, really important. And we can demonstrate it with this. And, yeah, people are trusting it more if they can see a digital twin first. Okay, yeah, I, I, I totally agree uh, with you, Philip, of course. Uh, Anyone else about this question or uh, otherwise we move to the next question? Okay. Well, I think we can, I, uh, we can yeah, sure. use also. Yeah, uh, 
via the FMA, Franco, as you know, we can use also uh, algorithms to optimize the structure so it reduces the costs for the client and, of course, the risks. Yeah, and talking about that, the uh, DFMA stands for Design for Manufacture and Assembly, but I, I, I was uh, uh, inspired, I was really amazed by after by, by your presentations because there are so many so many meanings behind this word so it's crazy this is not just the fma but it is a lot of different meanings a lot of different things behind just a simple words four letters but there is like a universe like a, a world an entire world behind this word franco and, maybe uh, um, one, yeah. um one one sure. thing also Please, to add John. i thought yeah, I thought what um, what Philip uh, mentioned, um, you know, there's a there's a range of um, DFMA uh, that could go in in a project and showed, uh, you know, hand sketches and it, it really about a, a, a way of thinking about um, an approach towards design, you know, and thinking about materials and connections and systems and constructability in the beginning. Um, you know, from things of, uh, you know, the way you're drawing a building, maybe you're not elaborating um, to a high level of resolution or through sketches all the way um, to more sophisticated digital design processes. But I think that's an interesting also uh, point about, um, you know, back to the question of like risks, you know, is there risks? Is this, does this de-risk? Is there challenges with owners? Um, you know, I, I think project teams at the very least can start to adopt uh, ways of thinking, you know, particularly in the realm of, of mass timber where, you know, an architect can can talk to multiple manufacturers, understand certain constraints or GCs and contractors, a couple connection suppliers, look at precedents and then really get and start to design a building from that early phase in a sketch kind of format that really has the DNA of something that could advance towards uh, a higher uh, a higher likelihood of actually going through. So I think that's an interesting way. There's it's a kind of mindset of thinking, you know, particularly towards design and manufacture or engineering in the early phases that can uh, have significant significant upside. Well, sure. Thank you, thank you, uh, John. Absolutely. Sure. Uh, so. Let's move to the to the next question. I need to read it, and um, it is quite long, but it, it comes from a, a company we're working with. Uh, we um, we've been working together with them. We worked together with them for a nice project in Australia, which is more than ten thousand kilometers away from here. But we proved that digitization allows us to easily share the, the digital model with the clients, with the architects, and to share all the information. So um, the question is this one. How would you answer to a client, a developer, which could be a developer or a council or a public organization, that it is skeptical of liaising on too early in the process with a single, just a single supplier? Because the problem is that some of the GLT, CLT suppliers provide a unique solutions, something that once designed in the building cannot be changed or cannot be changed easily. Are the clients worried about it or just they simply look at the best overall cost on the table, supply, assembly and construction? So this is the problem. This is a problem we're facing a lot of time. If our client goes to the supplier, the specific supplier, then we get a unique kind of a unique solution. And once the, um, if the designer, sorry, goes at the beginning to the supplier, then we get a unique solution. And then they will put out the tender. And if someone wants to change the, uh, the solution, it will be a kind of a big problem, which will, uh, slow down the project which we create a lot of problems so how how would you solve this problem i know it's a kind of a million dollar question but uh, i'm 
I would like to know uh, to hear from you. Maybe. Philip. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's pretty simple. If you want a timber building, get a timber engineering role from the beginning. And I think it, this is something where we need to grow the knowledge, where we need to grow the offering that we have timber engineers all over the world who can come into a project and design a timber building that the, that the client is not just solely relying on, on manufacturers. Um, because yes, it's clear, if you have a manufacturer, quite often they also do a lot of the engineering for free, which is, which is really annoying for us, I know for you as well, that they do it for free, um, but they embed themselves so much in the project. And I think this is the next step the timber industry has to make. Because now we have so many suppliers, say CLT and Glulam, it, it really needs to be standardized. It should make a difference if you use producer A, B and C, especially in Central Europe. I think we have so many suppliers and it's really the same. It needs to be treated as the same. And we really need to get this European standard for the CLT. In, in Europe over the line. And that will really help because it's the same thing with steel. Steel and concrete, you get an engineer on board who helps you to develop. And on the end, nobody cares where the steel is coming from because it's produced to a standard. And that's where we need to get the timber industry to as well. But it needs more people who know how to design with timber. And I think that is really a call out for more timber engineers. Thank you very much. I think you're right in my mind, Philip. We are, you know, we are exactly on the same page. I have, a, I have a comment to add. I think the situation's completely different in the U.S. Um, you're having a hard time sourcing mass timber right now. Um, there aren't a lot of available mass timber manufacturers providing engineering for free. In fact, good luck finding your mass timber in the U.S. It's not a commodity product. There are very few producers compared to Central Europe and many of the producers are producing unique CLT. Different dimensions, different kinds of wood, so the choices are very limited in the US and demand far exceeds supply. So it's a different situation. And yes, consult with, essentially my advice is consult with people who have experience building successful mass timber projects, designing them, engineering them, being the general contractors and being the manufacturers. And generally, you're also, you're also going to need to specifically do that in a specific market. Uh, building on the coast in California or in the mountains is very, very different than New York. The climates are different. The building regulations are extremely different, even in different municipalities. Uh, use the San Francisco Bay Area. There's 101 municipalities in that, in that area alone, and they have a lot of different building codes. So you, you do need a lot of local knowledge. Yeah. Once again, timber engineers, I'm not saying that we are like a sort of a, sort of a uh, group, a secret group, but the structural engineers, timber engineers are, can be really the key to change this, uh, this market. And I'm happy to see the difference between different countries, between different continents, how the situation is. Um, so we have I a think, next, uh, sorry, maybe, okay. maybe just to add, I think you, Frank, yeah. and we work in a similar space. We work worldwide. When we were in another country, we both worked in Singapore. We, we, pro we provided the timber knowledge, the mass timber knowledge, but the local knowledge is you still need the local team. And I think that is a really important thing. We don't want to push the locals out. We want to support and help. We need to grow. And I fully get what Greg is saying. We have the same in Europe at the moment as well. There is more demand than supply. We can help from the beginning because a lot of the clients are saying, oh, it's anyway so scarce. Why should we even go for mass timber? We need, we need to widen that because maybe in five years time, it looks different. We need to look forward into the future. And that's collaboration, not try to muscle in. Yeah. Collaboration is, is another key word <laughs> after the event, after two days event. Uh, yeah, absolutely. We, we, I'm not saying to kick out the, uh, the other, the local engineers. I'm 
more talking about collaborating with them uh, to be part of the workflow, to be part of the designers team. So there is another uh, there is another question which is about detailing uh, connection design. I saw many times in the projects uh, uh, a beam and the column, and then it is written the connection on the manufacturer. The connection will be designed by the manufacturer, and this is something that. Uh, this is something quite challenging sometimes because they we, we design the, the connection, we get back to the architects. Perhaps they have to change the size of the depth of the beams or the size of the elements. So how can we um, how can we change? How can we promote this new way of uh, designing uh, the building? Uh, I think that uh, organizations like IAMTC can help also the Mass Timber City, who is uh, run by, uh, by Greg, uh, IAMTC run by Philip and Paul, uh, can help us in doing this. But how do you see this uh, in general, the detailing uh, problems and how can it, can it be, can be this part integrated in the workflow? I mean, is, is it again uh, something uh, related to the timber engineers, as I think mostly? I think it is one thing, yeah, that you have somebody who, who knows how to do it. But we also need to have better literature because I'm, I'm privileged. I speak German and English. Um, therefore, most of the stuff I can read. But I know from, from some of my colleagues, from the International Mass Timber Association as well, they, they say a lot of the stuff is not available in, in Spanish, for example, and that there is a large community yeah. in the world who speaks Spanish. And this is something we need to do. We need to be able to share this. We need to, we need to produce guides and not just by, by one single manufacturer. Or oh, there are people out there, especially on the, on the fixing side, um, one Italian company, or they do a lot, but then people people are really worried about that. I then fix myself to Rotoblast to name it, or on the other market, Simpson, for example, is really strong. But that's where, for example, in Switzerland, we have a lot of guidance where where it just says these are the these are the numbers, these are the resistance for screws, and it doesn't matter if it comes from from company A, B, C, or D. I mean, therefore. If we if we create this and use it all over the all over the world, because does it really matter? Or well, we know the difference in screws is not that big, and that's what we need to create. And that's also one thing what we try to do through the association is providing education, but also pr providing guidance and bring the different countries together to share that knowledge. Because yes, it would be great if everybody who wants to build a mass timber building comes to us too. And then we can create these massive companies. Oh, but it doesn't, it, that's not really the solution. We want structural engineers, architects, that they can get a, a quick scheme design and it's not completely wrong. Oh. And do you think, uh, there is a question for all of, uh, of the panelists. Um, you, mentioned, uh, you, you mentioned, Philip, the word uh, education. My experience is that the universities are not ready for timber, are not ready for DFMA. Uh, or this is my personal opinion, of course, but uh, I, I receive uh, emails during the years uh, asking me, how can I get a timber engineer? How can, where can I find more information? How can I get the information I need? Uh, how can I go on the market and promote myself as timber engineer. I need to gain experience, but where can I gain this experience? Because at the university, nobody taught about timber, or at least this is my, 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 my feeling. What do you think in, uh, in your area, for instance, Greg, in, uh, on the West Coast uh, or, or in the East Coast, John? Yeah, I... I think it's uh, 
you know, it's, it's a challenge and from education geared towards architects and um, structural engineers uh, as well. I mean, there's a couple catalyst universities, I would say, that have been embracing it, um, you know, on the, in the southeast, uh, on the west coast, certainly with the Tallwood Institute. Um, in, in the northeast, um, there is uh, a couple schools, uh, UMass, uh, Peggy Clouston, uh, that did the UMass, was involved in UMass Amherst design building, um, has built out an engineering program. And I think it takes uh, champions in the, in the institutes to be able to, one, um, establish a credible curriculum uh, and then excite the, the other community members at the, at the institution, but also bring in funds to be able to support that kind of new education program. So as, you know, as Greg has mentioned a couple of times, like Mass Timber in the U.S. is exploding. I think everyone, the, the initial excitement is there. Now it's just, you know, getting up on the curve to where this becomes a uh, normal practice over the next decade or two. Uh, and I think a big part of that is uh, institutions. And we're, we're certainly seeing a, uh, an increase in interest, but, um, probably not as fast as everyone would appreciate or want. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah, and I would, I would add that I think, I think kind of a good problem, but also a problem, again, demand exceeds supply. We have more universities moving in the right direction, uh, but the leadership is happening, I think, mostly within private industry. Therefore, as you said, Franco, information needs to be shared. And I do hope, uh, I think Paul is leading some of that, let's call it uh, informal trade associations or at portals where information is shared within the community. I think really it's the only way because engineering is not going to slow down, it's going to speed up. Demand, I, I really think at least here in the US is going to continue to exceed supply. So which parts of industry, academia, and or with government support help share information? Because a lot of it does cross international boundaries. And I, it, as, as Philip mentioned, a lot of it is stuck, for example, in German. And it's not making it over into English. And therefore, it's, it's essentially lost. I, that's a big problem, but I think it needs a lot of people to help solve it. And that's a, that's a good point. One of the things that I showed earlier in the presentation, our, our intent is to keep aggregating a, a consortium uh, from industry to help set the standards, at least for North America, with a few different building solutions that could be used in academic circles to help um, educate and get familiarity in the sort of digital space uh, for students. But additionally, as, as Greg mentioned, the demand exceeds the supply. Uh, if if there's more sophisticated demand, and that in that demand is able to uh, align with certain standards, that supply chain, at least in North America or extended to Europe, can connect with, um, that could provide uh, a lot of value uh, to, to both sides of the equation. So that's our hope for some of the work that we're doing is to is to be open source and to build a, a community around it to. Uh, establish the sta standards as much as possible because every project have their own nuances and and conditions, but to help advance that forward, at least in uh, in the U.S. here. Okay. Okay. I think maybe what I uh, what I would like to add as well is education is from it's from through the whole process. It's not just engineering, and I I think we also need to educate more people to work who work on site. And we need to show them the opportunity that you can start on site and you can end up in the office because we have a lot of people that are carpenters, they have a lot of experience, but because they don't want to be on site when they're 40, they will they leave the industry and therefore a lot of knowledge gets lost. How can we maintain, how can we keep these people in the industry and give them a secondary way of education? You don't need a PhD to build a CLT building. I think that is an important thing. I started from, I wouldn't call it from the bottom, 
I started from the start. And I think that is important. You can be a carpenter and on the end, you you end up as an engineer. Well, yeah, well, I, um, we engineered a, a few pavilions for the Biennale in Venice. And I must say that every time we made it, I moved from my city to Venice for one or two weeks working together with the carpenters. That is the best school ever I ever had. Because I worked together with them 8, 10, 11 hours per day. But it was amazing to use a screwdriver and to feel how heavy is a timber beam if you have to move by hand because you do not have the cranes. And working in Venice is like a nightmare every time we have to do this. Every time we have to deal with the logistic aspects, uh, moving uh, timber with bolts, etc. It's, it's a nightmare, but you learn a lot of things. So I really like to, uh, to spend uh, days uh, together with the carpenters side by side. Well, we're I would, running I would like late. To, to add, to add uh, sorry. Something yeah, please, please, Alan, you will be the last one because <laughs> Danny, we, okay. it's getting late. <laughs> sorry about that. But uh, yes. No, no problem. No problem. No problem. Guys, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, 20 years ago, I started as a carpenter also uh, working in the site building pergolas and decks, and that's the, the best school ever. But uh, from uh, a South American perspective, we're built here from a concrete uh, school. Uh, we do not have many uh, mass timber constrictions here yet, but uh, two big uh, manufacturers are coming next year, and I think it will uh, change our, our uh, industry here in South America. And um, in our universities here, they simply do not teach anything about timber, nothing. Um, not even steel they teach here, so it's all concrete. So we have a, a really great uh, job to change uh, the mindset from people from South America. But uh, as I always say, as I always say, um, the mass timber is like the electric cars. They will come. <laughs> and you, you cannot run from them. You cannot hide from them. They will come. And we're ready. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, thank you, thank big, big thank you to everyone for uh, being uh, my guest uh, at this first uh, edition of the DFMA conference. Um, we have a lot, there are a lot of questions on Zoom and LinkedIn and on YouTube. I cannot, uh, it will be very late, it will become very late. So what we will do is we will, uh, the, the entire video of the event will be available for free for everyone forever, hopefully on the platform YouTube uh, in the next few days. I think Tuesday, Wednesday, something like that. And uh, on the, our website, we will add all the comments we receive, uh, uh, we received on the different platforms. And so it will be possible to interact, uh, uh, especially it will be on LinkedIn, we will post all the comments, etc. So it will, it will be possible for everyone to reply or to join the conversation. Uh, what else? Thank you to Giorgio, the, the man behind, uh, the man in the, in the control room. And uh, I'm sure that there will be a second edition next year, DFMA 2023. And yeah, again, thank you and good morning, good evening, good night to everyone. A big applause to every one of us. Thank you.